Okay, now that we've moved past the analysis phase, we're going to move into the next stage, or the next par phase of, of the ADI paradigm, which is design. Again, if you look at this in the overall step, and, and they're portrayed in this way because it's not designed to be a lockstep thing. You'll notice that there's a great deal of overlap between the analysis stage and the design stage, between the design stage and the development stage, between the development stage, the implementation stage, and so on. And the reason that's portrayed like that is because it's not a case where you do the analysis, then you move on to the design. Um, once you finish doing some of the analysis, you'll start to work on some of the design, and you'll continue to revisit these things. At least that's the way it will work for the most part if you were to do this in the real world. Uh, for the purposes of this course, obviously, we're moving in a very lockstep sequential manner, um, but that's not necessarily the way it happens um, out there and depending on the specific model that you use in some cases uh, I can use the rapid prototyping model as a good example in some cases you're doing a number of these steps at the same time so again looking at this the whole point of this process is to try to close this gap that exists this performance discrepancy that exists and the only thing that we can use training in order to close the gap is if there is a lack of knowledge or skill. If it's a lack of or limited resources or a lack of motivation, training will not do anything to close that gap. And through your analysis, you should have been able to determine what percentage of this gap between actual and desired performance can be related to lack of knowledge or skill, because that's the gap that you'll be able to close. So the purpose of this particular presentation is to basically look through the various steps of the design process, particularly how we go about verifying the desired performances and then selecting appropriate testing methods for them. If you look at the various procedures in the design phase, there are four procedures. Now, there are only three that you're responsible for in this course, and that's conduct a task inventory, compose performance objectives, and generate testing strategies. The fourth one is calculate return on investment, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end, but you will not be responsible for that as part of this course. When you finish the design phase, the document that you would provide is a design brief and that's something that like the analysis um, document you would get your client to sign off of um, so let's take a look at these steps the first one was conduct a task inventory and essentially what I want you to do here as a way of getting into this topic is is to think back to the process of learning to ride a bicycle and try to write down all of the steps that you need to be able to do in order to learn how to ride a bike. Um, so sequentially all the things that you would be required to do. And now would be a good time to pause just to take a second to do that. So get a piece of paper and a pencil and just write down the steps in which it, you believe are necessary for learning how to ride a bicycle. Okay, so our objective for this first part is to look at how we inventory performance tasks. And again, the whole point of this is to close this gap that we have here. And so the, the tasks that you want are essentially the steps that you will take to close the performance discrepancy that is related to the lack of knowledge or skill. Now, your task inventory is going to look something like this. So you will have your purpose statement which you generated as a part of your analysis. You will have your instructional goals which you've generated as part of your analysis. Now the next thing is to look at all of the tasks that are necessary to achieve those goals. Um, so if you look at the way this one is designed, this one is set up in such a way that for each of the three goals there, there are three tasks. Each of those tasks have at least two subtasks underneath them, and you see some of those subtasks have, I guess, what you could call sub-subtasks. Um, and those sub-subtasks are the prerequisite knowledge and skills 
that a learner would need to have in order to start this training. So the items that you see there in the blue font, those are the things that the learner would need to have before they took the course in which you are about to design. If they don't have those, then they really aren't ready for the training that you're about to give them. So you need to make sure, you need to find a way essentially to give them that information. Um, if you want to think about our course as a good example, the items in blue, one of the things that we did in our course was the baseline activity. Because everyone was entering the course at various stages in terms of their courses in instructional technology, their practical experience with the process of instructional design, even with the length of time they've been in our program, um, that means that you are all starting at a different point. And in order to get you all to start at a similar point, so in order to get you to where I could start with everybody at that dotted line that goes across the bottom there, I created a baseline activity which was designed to knock off all of those tasks that you see there in the blue font so that we could begin the course with all of the stuff that you see in the black font. So when you look at, at a task inventory, which is what we were just looking at, it's basically just a logical way to organize the content and it allows you to be able to see in a very easy manner um, the knowledge and skills and the specific procedures underneath those knowledge and skills that you want your learners to be able to construct. Um, it's the first process or first procedure that you would go through in the design phase. And in a lot of cases, the client will never actually see the task inventory. They'll see the next two steps that go along with it, but they'll never actually see the task inventory um, because it's, it's not necessary for them to understand this in a visual way. Um, basically, as long as they can see the connection between what the learners are doing and how you're being tested, um, that's usually enough for them. But it's important to undergo this this process because for a number of reasons. Um, it specifies all of the individual desired performances that go into making each goal. Um, it identifies each of the tasks for that goal. It actually does a sequential inventory for all of the various steps that a person would need in order to be able to reach each of the goal. And by going through and determining which tasks are part of the training and which tasks should be prerequisite things, it actually helps get the learner ready for undertaking the training that you're about to deliver. Um, so there are three common steps that you have here. The first is that you would want to identify or confirm the instructional goals and those were the items that were across the top of the page a minute ago. Um, and then you want to identify all of the tasks that go into each of those goals um, and determine wh at what level those tasks are, so which ones build upon which uh, other ones, which ones should be sequenced first, uh, second and third, and that type of thing. And then to specify which of those tasks should be prerequisite knowledge and skills in order um, so that the learner can be better prepared prior to starting your training. When you're looking at writing these things, um, your tasks should all begin with performance verbs. Um, your tasks don't contain conditions or criteria. Um, you don't want to repeat any of your tasks. So if something is in, in goal three is important, um, if there's a task from goal three that um, you would have initially learned in goal one, you don't need to repeat it. You just need to make sure that the task is sequential in such a way that by the time you get to goal three, you've done all of the things that you need to do. Um, you want to be very specific in these, and you want to, again, separate in the way in which we did it in the visual a few slides ago was with that dotted line, but you want to separate those prerequisites. The second item that's in the, the design phase is to actually compose the performance objectives. Um, so what you want to do here is you want to um, create an, an objective that defines exactly what the training should accomplish. Um, and there's a value in, in, in having objectives. Specifically, it lets the learners know what they should be, uh, what they should expect to learn in the, 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 the training. Um, it lets the facilitators know exactly what they should be teaching or facilitating. It also lets managers know the results. So after somebody has gone through your training, the manager 
um, should be able to sit down and essentially review their performance of their employees, of the learners who have gone through your training, and based upon your list of objectives, they should be able to see results on those specific items. And in theory, those items are the items in the gap that were contributed or attributable to the lack of knowledge or skills. So an objective specifically is a clear description of what you expect the learners to be able to do. Um, it should outline the performance that you want them to be able to do um, at a level that you want them that's considered competent. Um, so what you're looking at here is not necessarily a way of, 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 of grading them. Um, basically, you're looking at kind of like a pass-fail kind of thing. Um, you know, I want you to be able to do X under these particular conditions. In terms of some of the practical uses, um, it actually helps when you're actually trying to select the materials, um, what content you're going to do, and how you're going to go about teaching those items. Um, it is a wonderful way to measure whether or not the training has been successful. Um, and it also allows the learner a way of organizing their own thoughts and perspectives as to how they're going to go about accomplishing uh, the tasks, specifically if you've sequenced them correctly. Um, so if you look at the components of an objective, there are really three components. There's the performance which is what you expect them to do. There's the condition, which essentially refers to under what conditions do you expect them to be able to complete the performance. And then there's the criteria, which really refers to what level. And in the presentation that deals with uh, performance objectives, you'll see there will be, I guess, much more information on these three items and how to go about constructing them. In terms of, of actually doing the performance and looking at the condition and criteria, what you want to do here is you want to try to have as much congruency between the learning space and the performance space. For example, if you look at this graphic where the performance space, meaning where they will be expected to do the task um, in the real world on the job, is represented by the green, but the way in which they are expected to do it um, in the cla in the classroom or in the where the training takes place is represented in the red. As you can see here, there's not a high deal, a high degree of fidelity between the classroom space or the learning space and the performance space, the on the job space. Um, a good example of this would be trying to teach someone to drive simply by having them read a textbook or by lecturing to them about you know the wonder how you go about um, trying to drive a car. What you want to try to do is to try to increase so that the learning space and the performance space have as much fidelity as possible. Again, using our driving the car example, if you were trying to teach someone how to drive a car by putting them in a simulator where they were in this environment where they could push on the pedals and turn the wheel and what comes up on the screen which is in the shape of a windshield in front of them is very much like what they would see when they were out on the road that's a situation where you've got a higher degree of fidelity between your learning space and your performance space the third item in design is generate testing strategies um, and Really, I mean, I guess the basic question is why would you want to test? What is the purpose of testing? Um, if you use Kirkpatrick's five levels of evaluation as a way of looking at how we go about evaluating um, whether or not training is effective or the results of training, testing looks at level two, that learning thing, essentially trying to figure out what did the learners come away with or learn from your training. Um, basically, did they meet the objective that you set out for them? Were they able to demonstrate the performance that you had listed in the objective? Did they meet that performance underneath the specified criteria in the specific conditions that you had outlined? Looking at the last item in the design procedure, and this was the one that was grayed out, um, calculate the return on investment. What you're looking at here, and again, I'll use Kirkpatrick as a good way of, of 
looking at an overview of this, you're looking at that level five there, the return on investment. Um, to give you, I guess, some sense of these, the reaction level is um, your little bubble chart that you give the learners at the end of the session. You know, did they like this? Do they feel that, um, you know, it was it was good? Um, the forms that you guys fill out at the end of a semester that l evaluates um, the course and the teacher, you know, was the course too hard? Did it increase my level of interest in the topic? Was the instructor responsive? Um, did they provide good feedback? Um, did the assignments test what was in the content? That kind of thing. That's a good example of a reaction sheet. The learning one we just looked at, that's actually testing whether or not they learned the objectives. Um, the job application looks at whether or not you were able to transfer the training back to uh, the on-the-job tasks. So if you guys were instructional designers, one of the things that you would look at as a level three evaluation of this course is whether or not you were doing the types of things that I'm teaching you how to do in this course when you went back and were under on the job doing instructional design. Um, the business results look at has it made a difference in the overall performance of the business. The return on investment basically is was it worth the money I paid for it? So essentially what you're looking at there is you're looking at an assessment of were the business results, so were the level four item um, of the evaluation, were those worth the money that it took to get this training delivered? Um, and there are specific formulas that you can use to figure out that, and there are a variety of them, depending on a lot of cases, just the business model and what's considered an acceptable return on investment. Um, they tend to be very um, domain specific. So depending on what sector of business or what sector of the corporate environment you come from, a return on investment or what's an acceptable level of return on investment um, would be very different from one industry to another, which is why we don't focus upon it that much here other than to let you know what it is and that it's something that um, in the re in an actual instructional design environment, it's something you would need to be concerned about. Um, so again, those are the four procedures. Uh, the three that you see there in black are ones that there will be individual presentations and notes on each of those. Um, and again, the return on investment one is one that we won't worry about for the purposes of this course. If you go on to do the advanced instructional design course, it's one that you will get into more in that course. The deliverable for the design phase is a design brief. And again, to give you a sense as to where it falls into the scheme of the ADDIE paradigm here, um, obviously the next one, which we will start next week, is the development one, which I believe we spend a couple of weeks on. 